Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. I'm super excited that eToro is sponsoring Untold Stories because the CEO of eToro has been tweeting about Bitcoin since 2012. That's true OG. Now, eToro has become one of the largest crypto companies in the world with over $1 trillion in trading volume per year. U.S. customers can trade the most popular crypto assets with extraordinarily low and transparent fees. And if you're not ready to trade yet, Practice building your crypto portfolio with the eToro $100,000 virtual trading feature. Best of all, you can connect with 11 million other eToro traders around the world, myself included, to discuss trading, charts, and all things crypto. Create an account today at eToro.com. Links are in the show notes. And build your crypto portfolio the smart way. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at CryptoMining.Tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. Links are in the show notes. Untold Stories is powered by Blockworks Group, the only event and podcast production company I trust. For access to the premier digital asset conferences and in-depth podcast content, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. Io. I promise you will not be disappointed. It's very interesting because on this show, we have a lot of people that I feel like I always preface my show by talking about this, but we have people on this show that really are hustlers and do some, some crazy shit. And when you read their bios, you know, I do the research before the show and I'm reading a little bit about my, my guests and I'm like, no way. I need to ask about about this. Like the first question I'm going to ask. But let me give you a little bit of a brief a brief background of my guest Amber Balde. Just for her bio, she's she was formerly the blockchain program lead at JP Morgan Chase. And now she founded a company called Clover. And so she left the Wall Street like like huge career that, you know, your friend who works at Fidelity branch down the road wishes he had this job. She left this job. Not only that, but she was on the team and uh, led the team that built Quorum, which is JP Morgan's um, blockchain project, to start her own company in my hometown of Brooklyn. She was on Fortune's 40 under 40 list. And just recently, she was appointed uh, to the board of the Zcash Foundation, which um, governs, as we all know, Zcash, which is completely different from what she was doing at JP Morgan. Amber, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. So... This is what really threw me off a little bit. You were interviewing at JP Morgan and you were about to give birth the next day. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I already worked at JP Morgan. I was there for almost uh, eight years, I guess. I started as a consultant um, after the financial collapse in 2008. I was a consultant there. It was really the only way to kind of get a job and then transitioned um, full time. But all of my favorite engineers were moving to this cool new product development group. And so I was interviewing to transition internally to that group and had heard the manager was kind of a hard ass. So I didn't want to miss the interview. I thought it was a test. It turned out he did not know I was pregnant. He was 28 and horrified. Um, but I guess it worked out in the end. <laughs> it did work out. So what that wasn't that I guess was too early. That wasn't the blockchain group that what type of group was that? It was. It was well. It was the new product development group, and they covered machine learning, um, cloud strategy, blockchain, um, you, cognitive learning, all that kind of stuff. So initially, I went into the machine learning team because blockchain was like two or three people, um, and then they didn't really have a product uh, organization yet. It was really just a couple developers playing around. And then, as it kind of became more formalized, um, I 
ended up pulling those that team together and kind of building it out into a larger organization. In 2012, I think it was 2012, 2012, um, my, um, my cousin, who was also like, she was like my babysitter and everything and, and um, grew up in the same community in, in New York. She was a vice president, maybe still is, at uh, J.P. Morgan. And I one time um, went there to the office, you know, and I was this kid. I was just graduating high school. I was maybe first year in college. And I walk up to the building right near Grand Central, this big behemoth of a building. And I show up and I'm going like to the 800th floor and I go to her office and we're talking about Bitcoin and I feel like we were like whispering because like here I am in like the the dragon's den talking about this Bitcoin thing that at the time Bitcoin was we were all like anarcho capitalist like libertarian type people and here I am like she's a vice president um, at, at JP Morgan and we're talking about Bitcoin and she ended up making some presentations about it. But it was so interesting and I was like really nervous because I felt like I didn't belong there. Yeah, I I guess I never really quite fit in. But those organizations are collections of people and a lot of them are. Yeah, right. A lot of them are there just to kind of collect a paycheck and, you know, fill in their spreadsheet and go home. And it's not a philosophical kind of thing. Like most people there at any large organization, they don't wake up and think, you know, like, how can I screw the little guy today? They're just performing one function in a much larger organism. Um, so I, I had never really attempted to go into banking. I was always a technologist. Um, I studied economics and political science. And I guess the joke was always, you know, if you want to make money, study finance. If you want to know why other people are making money, study economics. So I was never um, in like the sales and, and front office trading. I was doing support and building tooling. And the people in those positions are really very different. There's also a lot of um, H-1B workers that are working on sending remittances back home. Um, there, you know, I remember being in uh, Chase Manhattan Plaza during Occupy Wall Street and my entire team kind of looking out of, of developers looking out as it was very first assembling. And they're asking, what's going on? Why are these people protesting? I don't understand because it just wasn't even part of their culture. Um, and really, people probably should have been protesting in Midtown, not downtown where Tech and Ops was. But that's a very good point, And I'm happy you made that point. Um, you know, we talk about the big bad banks and the big bad government and the big bad wolf. But but most of the time, 99 percent of it, like and that's a perfect example there. They were protesting in the wrong place. Most of the time, they're just. People that go to work every day and have no involvement, they're cogs and machines. They have no involvement in these decisions. No one's pushing a button and saying, oh, here, let me push this button and screw over a million little people. Oh, let's let's go to a meeting today and evict 100,000 people from their homes in Michigan. It's not like that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a banking apologist in any way. I mean, obviously, it, the, the re- <laughs> I never heard that term before. Yeah. Well, what is that term? Well, well, I mean, an apologist for anything kind of, you know, I'm not saying like we didn't really know what is going on. Um, banking apologists. Yeah. But uh, no one raindrop believes that it is responsible for the flood. And when you get these significantly large enough institutions, yeah, they're highly centralized in that there is a centralized strategy. But ironically, it has a very kind of decentralized way of functioning. There, there's not really communication between different groups and that obfuscation. It creates information asymmetries even within an organization. You don't necessarily know the full scope of what's going on. And I'm not really sure if anyone does. Um, and so you get outcomes that were not necessarily what you intended. Um, and sure, a lot of those are, are negative. I, I was, you know, I I knew what banking was when I went into it, but I was interested in kind of the power structures and how this stuff really works and what's going on in the world. I didn't think at the time that going to work at a startup and being on the other side of the wall was really going to help me um, actually be disruptive or understand anything. You studied economics, right? I did. And you're working now. Are you looking at, because I also studied economics and you've probably heard my, my prison stories and everything how I was in there watching these markets emerge while in there. Um, Do you do the same thing? Do you kind of study and and watch from an economics point of view and more, more of like socioeconomics on how people are acting and reacting and um, 
handling things like money and markets? Sure. Um, I think I, I notice um, markets that are not just financial, I guess. There's a lot to be said for social capital and intellectual capital and information arbitrage. Um, the first place I worked at actually in South Florida um, was in a research boutique uh, that what's a research boutique? well I'm not gonna I won't go, <laughs> I won't go super deep on the history of the financial markets but um, there was some regulation uh, passed in the late 90s that was meant to separate uh, research departments from trading departments uh, in that the research was simply selling the book uh, of the prop trading um, proprietary trading groups and so it was completely biased and uh, so there was supposed to be this independence there. Um, and so this was a kind of startup research company that was meant to have completely independent research. They, we covered biotech, tech, and pharma and some special situations. Uh, and that meant, you know, we would make relationships with doctors and then find out whether or not peer review had actually been done on drugs going through the FDA review process, for example. Or you would go to retail stores and sit on the floor and confirm whether or not the data in these company reports was accurate. So there was a lot of sell recommendations, uh, which turns into basically shorting activities activity in the market. And it was about being a counter check on this kind of irrational exuberance of research reports that always say buy, buy, buy. Um, because you were like the control rods in a nuclear reactor. Yeah. We, well, we were the, I guess. I just watched Chernobyl last night. <laughs> Great show. Yeah. So, we were, by the way, it was amazing. Yeah. We were the, um, uh, being it, it was about finding counterintuitive um, results, right? So I remember helping as a little intern, kind of helping the senior analyst put together a PowerPoint on why you should short countrywide in 2004, um, which was going into the largest mortgage boom in history, probably the worst time to tell your customers to short something, um, <laughs> which is when I learned that it's more than being right. You have to be right at the right time. Um, really? But, so this is 2004 right. it, and you were calling some issues in the, in the real estate market? It was obvious that this tranching um, stuff was absolutely the, – the CLOs and, and all – it was But it was a lot a of people tell me that. Yeah. A lot of people tell me that. But what, then why was nothing done? Um, because the voices saying this is wrong were small. And I mean if you want – that's kind of the entire plot of that movie, The Big Short. <laughs> You know, Great movie. Um, but that's that's how it was. So that was my first exposure to fi financial markets, though, um, in a, you know, beyond just watching CNBC, I guess. And so learning to kind of always um, to not necessarily mistrust, but to be skeptical of what else is going on in the room and to see, to your point about like seeing these kind of economic markets places, to see where are there not counter checks? Where do we have all these accumulations of capital? Where does where does everybody think the same thing? Because that means that there's something that's not being investigated. It's almost like you want to be ahead of the puck. But it's not just that. It's not like in the startup world. It's if everyone, if you're in an echo chamber and everyone is agreeing with you and everyone's agreeing, if everyone's on the same team, then that's a problem in and of itself. Why? Um, well, I mean, it's not necessarily a problem if you're looking for arbitrage opportunities, right? Because it probably means that there's value captured up there. Um but uh, I mean, that's that's a reasonable argument for why people look to increase diversity on their teams, right? You, you get blind spots and it makes you susceptible to single points of failure in your thinking, where if you had had a more broad view, you would have caught things earlier. Isn't that the the whole point of blockchains is not having that single point of failure? Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it gets a little complicated once we start talking about this super complex marketplace we have now of like thousands of different groups that all believe they're right about different things. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting time to be here. Sure. I'm launching a new coin called Bitcoin Charlie's vision. <laughs> I have no comment on that. I have talked, I've talked to a bunch of people about it and they all tell me it's a really bad idea, but I would do it as a joke to showcase how stupid the idea of a vision is. I grew up in a very religious uh, Orthodox Jewish community and although I have a lot of friends and respect people who have faith, whatever that faith may be, it wasn't for me. But what I learned is that vision or you can't follow or do something based on blind faith because someone said that. So the whole concept of following like Satoshi's vision is stupid in and of itself. That's just my those are my thoughts. You don't have to you don't have to comment on that. But that's just kind of what I what I think in my in my vision. So I'm going to launch a coin called Charlie's Vision. And Charlie's Vision is 
basically do whatever you want. Yeah, go for it. I think um, Vlad Zamfir this morning had tweeted something like, you don't need someone in authority to tell you what to think. And um, I had kind of jokingly replied, you know, you'll pay good money to know what you think, Uh, which is a quote from a relatively obscure um, Robert Anton Wilson uh, publication. Um, But uh, I I think I had a, a similar well, diff- I, a similar but different kind of experience in that um, I was around uh, people that thought a lot of different things growing up, I guess. But um, I think it, being in exposed to uh, people who strongly believe something that you also see people strongly believe something else, uh, again, leads you to be skeptical. And um, that kind of undermines the idea of a singular vision. And I think that's, that's a good thing. That's a good point. So I'm going to tell you a good story. Um, this is supposed to be untold stories of Amber, but you reminded me of a really good story. Okay. Um, and you studied economics and you work in economics and I don't really speak to many people who, who, who have done that or who do that. Although in, in crypto, everyone says that they're an economist. Yeah, I would not say I'm an economist any more than I would say I'm a cryptographer, but I do a little bit of an, of everything, I guess. <laughs> I feel like economics is a hobby. More of it is like, it's fun. It's, it, it, okay, is it a pseudoscience? Really okay. So this is my take on economics. And I think, I think, and uh, this is all from personal experience, all from, personal experience. Economics is more human behavior than it is math. And you look at the math and it can, it can explain things. And I'll, and I'll tell you a story of why, and you're going to, you're, you're going to, you're going to really like this, but essentially I believe that, um, economics is, is more human behavior. So I think that the term economics should always be coupled with socioeconomics. And I'll give you a story. Um, in prison, and I always explain things through this because here, so the, so the, the prison marketplace is think of it like North Korea or Cuba, where you have a centrally controlled economy and you have a completely centrally controlled um, system that you can't leave and you, you, you have no say in how the financial markets work. So in prison, um, you basically have, <clears throat> you have your family and friends can send you money and what that means is they can go to like Western Union or they can go to the Bureau, Bureau of Prisons website and they can send you um, like a Western Union and it hits your account. Um, and you can have as much money on your account as you want, but you can only spend at commissary um, up to $140 a week and you only go to commissary once a week. So that's basically no matter if you're a billionaire on the outside or if your family has no two pennies to pinch together – Everyone's the same. You have the same amount of money that you can spend every week. You can't spend more than that amount. It's like a universal and basic income. Yes, it's kind of like that. that. And <laughs> yeah, and you and you work. You work. You know, you have a job in jail, and and you make you know anywhere from from eighty to a few hundred bucks a week. Anyway, so it's kind of like the same thing. You 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 earn money, so you don't have to even rely on people to send you money on the outside. You earn. So everyone's the same. Billionaires and and low level drug dealers or whatever, we're, we're all the same. Everyone's the same um, in, in prison. And so you have a commissary and the commissary is basically like this big, long sheet of paper. And it has a list of like a few hundred items that you can buy in commissary. And so like the night before your, it's your commissary day and your commissary day is either Tuesday or Wednesday, the night before your commissary day, you sit, you know, it would be everyone would make a whole thing of it. You'd sit around and you'd fill out your commissary sheet You'd go through whatever is in your locker or whatever you have. And you'd say, oh, I need more tuna packets. I need more, you know, packets of mackerel. I need more um, jars of peanut butter or some ramen soup. I need more soap. I need more shoes. I need more um, spices. I need more um, Gatorade, what, whatever you want to buy. It's all shelf stable stuff. Obviously, there's no refrigeration. And you'd fill out your, your, your commissary sheet. And the next day you'd go up in the morning, you'd wait online, you'd give them, you'd have like a big net laundry bag and you'd hand them the sheet you put your laundry bag below like a, it's like a little like funnel thing and your stuff would start like sliding out of this funnel thing. And it was literally like communism. Like that's how it was. Um, and that was where you got all your stuff, centrally controlled um, economy, centrally controlled markets. And that's how it was. Why am I telling you the story? You know better than I do. Of course, what happens when you have a centrally controlled economy, there will be a flourishing black market. 
And same thing like in all these economies, Venezuela, North Korea, Cuba, um, anywhere where there's a very, very tightly controlled uh, market, you're going to have a black market and you're going to have a flourishing black market. So how does our black market work in the absence of money? We have no money. We have no dollars. We can't transact with other inmates because if you transact with other inmates, there's no physical cash to do that. The The money that you have is in like a computer somewhere. So how do you do So So how do you do that? There's no cigarettes. Um, there's nothing to, to transact with. The inmate population over the course of time developed mackerel. And so why mackerel? What is mackerel? Um, you're familiar with like those tuna packets you can buy at the supermarket? I mean, I'm familiar with mackerel as a fish. Yeah, so mackerel's a fish. And you can buy these like packets of mackerel in soybean oil. And um, it's like, you know, you can buy single packets of tuna fish in the supermarket. Yep. Um, and so these are, and I don't know why inmates chose or the market chose mackerel over tuna, but mackerel was more of a currency. I think personally, I like mackerel better than tuna because mackerel is more like meaty and it's not like just chopped up mush. It's got like texture to it and it's, it's kind of like a mackerel filet. I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. And people would transact with mackerel. So if you wanted a haircut, you'd go to the barber and you'd say, hey, I want a haircut. And he'd say, all right, that's two max. And people would transact with mackerel. There's this whole economy around mackerel. And this was developed by the market. And then you'd see like, you'd see literally like credit markets show up. So what would happen is you'd have these, these inmates who ran these stores, you know, and they're basically inmates who had a lot of extra stuff. So for example, if you wanted peanut butter, but it was Saturday, or you wanted a packet of cheese and Ritz crackers to make something, you know, to cook a pizza in the microwave and you didn't have any, um, you didn't have any cheese left or whatever. You can go to one of these inmates and you can essentially, um, buy that from him and he would charge like double the price or a dollar higher than whatever commissary would charge. And then you can pay him in mackerel. But over time, mackerel became inefficient because who wants to pay cash for every single transaction, right? It's the same thing with a credit card. You want at some point to have like a credit limit. And then at the end of the month, you pay your credit card and it makes things a lot easier. And so what these inmate stores would do is they would run these, they would have these credit markets. And so you could essentially build up like a credit and no one's going to not repay the store, you know, because you can imagine what would happen if you didn't pay the guy. And then every Tuesday, whenever you're, you're, um, commissary day would come up the way you paid the inmate back who ran the store was he'd give you a list of things for you to buy for him on your commissary sheet makes sense so you'd have this whole um uh market show up right um so one day so so that's all the preface to the story that's not even the story yet so one day um i go to the guy who sells cold sodas and i was like hey man can i get a cold soda and he said, sure, that's going to be one Mac or it'll be two money Macs. And I'm like, what the hell's a money Mac? And he says, well, a money Mac is basically this. And he hands me a, a packet of mackerel that's like three years expired and um, you can't eat it. It's expired and it's like gooey and disgusting. So here all of a sudden you have these mackerel fish, which had utility. They, they had value because you can eat them. They were good sources of protein. Other inmates accepted them. But now you have this other currency that's accepted as a currency within the prison population that had no value whatsoever. It was expired mackerel packets. It was literally aluminum packets that had expired and old, gooey, disgusting fish that you cannot eat. It felt like feeling like an airbed. It was disgusting. But this had value. You can literally buy anything you wanted there. Um, with it, there was a there was an exchange rate, and then there were people that would literally. Uh, uh, operate like for, like currency exchangers. And that was the craziest thing. So when I asked you about like, did you study economics? Um, do you watch people? I'm watching this from like an uh, economics perspective. I'm watching this play out from like someone who had studied um, economics in college. This is what I'm, I'm studying and I'm seeing this happen. I mean, that's super interesting. It's very kind of uh, microeconomics trying to achieve some goals of macroeconomics because you have a very small cosmos in which you're operating. So you get a confluence of these things bumping up against each other. 
from household budgeting through kind of macro demand. So yeah, that's super interesting. And then so one day the the um, one inmate got I don't know what happened to him. No one knows what happened to him. Um, and he had like a whole collection of these money max, um, a huge amount. And so he disappeared and the, the the prison guards didn't know that these things had value. So what they did was they left one of those big mail bins of money max, hundreds of them sitting around, you know, in a hallway for anyone to take. And so instantly they debased the whole money Mac currency and people stopped accepting it. People stopped using it as a currency because they flooded it. They debased the currency and it was crazy to see. I saw people's like life savings get wiped out. Well, you needed a demirage system where you could credibly recover and then dispose of them. And it was an, ins- it was an insane thing. I wasn't sure if they did it on purpose or, or what they were doing. Ah, see, um, that's more interesting. I, I, I or not more interesting, but I am curious if perhaps they were aware that this was the secondary money system and so intentionally would do something to debase it. And I mean, that would be interesting to know. So I, I will never know, but it's a fun thought to think about. Like they weren't stupid. They knew what was going on. And so I think they said, Hey, instead of us throwing it away, what if we just left it there and gave it away and basically rendered these things completely, completely worthless? Yeah. Well, if you're losing authority, you need to do something to fix that. A good point. So totally to totally switch gears here for a second. You you worked on permissioned blockchains, and I'm I've been a very vocal opponent of permissioned blockchains. Why do you hate and databases? You, sorry, why, I'm just kidding. I said why do why do you hate databases? I I love databases, <laughs> but we shouldn't call databases blockchains. Well, it depends. I mean, we can argue about that, but there are plenty of projects that are not using something that is a, a blockchain data structure, and then no, it probably shouldn't be called that. There are some that are using that structure, so technically it is, um, but it the consensus participants may or may not be known. It's a different t- type of trusted environment. It's sol- solving different problems. It's a whole different thing. So I don't really think that they're comparable. Isn't the whole point of Bitcoin the concept of not having one single party have power over another party? Yeah. And so when you have these permission blockchains like Facebook's Libra coin, for example, it's I don't even think so, think it should be called a blockchain. Well, I don't think they actually call that a blockchain um, themselves, and it's not. It's got a different different structure happening underneath and a consensus mechanism, I think, called Hot Stuff. Um, but uh, they're they're solving different things now. I think the the Libra thing is an extra layer of conflation, um, simply because they are saying that that's supposed to be a publicly available. Um, digital currency, I wouldn't call it a cryptocurrency, in that it is not, you know, actually truly publicly usable without some sort of intervention by their system. Um, but that that's going to really confuse people. If you looked at a lot of the enterprise blockchain projects that are happening, they're not aimed at replacing retail cash. Uh, they're aimed at facilitating corporate settlement, which happens in money systems you would never see these days right now when it just happens to be inefficient, or it's about making sure we can track and trace derivatives, um, settlement processes, or proxy voting, or stuff that's like happen- happens right now, but it's just uh, distributed systems engineering has been around for you know 30 years, and it's complicated, uh, and it relies on having a single central operator and then getting the same information um, in near real time to many places so that you can act on it and managing the authentication and access to that information while having a single central uh, party that controls that is actually a problem for business because they all operate like their own little sovereign countries. So being able to do something where what de- for a reason they don't want yeah. to share data with other yeah people. so decentralization to them it's not about it's not really like a consumer problem they're trying to have control and privacy over their stuff while uh, and not having to surrender authority um, to others and so that's the way those systems are made it's not really solving the same problem as a public crypto system I see your point I see your point what I don't understand is isn't isn't a blockchain a pretty inefficient database though when operated that way 
Um, as a database and an information store, enterprises are mostly not storing actual data on the blockchain, or I have uh, really suggested that they do not do that for a number of privacy reasons. They're just using uh, it to transfer it's information? A, it's from... a coordination layer and a, um, an immutable log. Uh, you don't necessarily need a blockchain. I think something that looks closer to certificate transparency would probably solve a lot of their problems. But you, you know, it's hard enough to go in and start using some technical terms around these folks that have been handed a McKinsey white paper that says you need a blockchain. So in order to solve the business problems that they have, you say, here's your blockchain, you ask for a blockchain, here you go. <laughs> but what it really is under the hood is a, a, a whole bunch of different components that draw from some distributed systems engineering, some cryptographic assurance systems, like sometimes now they're messing with tokens, they weren't necessarily previously, but you can kind of put those things together. When you're talking about a different sort of trust environment, you can mess around with it in ways that you could not in a public system like Bitcoin. And so they, they, the systems, they look different. It's just the like hype and media and everything that has put these against each other. eToro is crypto trading made easy. It's one of the largest and smartest trading platforms in the world with extraordinarily low and transparent fees. Join myself and 11 million other traders and create an account at eToro.com. Links in the show notes and build your crypto portfolio the smart way. As a mining equipment broker, Scott Offord wants to make sure his clients are well informed and making data-backed business decisions. Scott created the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI for miners. It's a better way to compare the efficiency of various models of ASIC miners and to see how the price of the miner and the efficiency impacts your mining profitability. So check it out at CryptoMining.Tools and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. That's O F F O R D. S C O T T. How do you tell the difference from like from like a Long Island iced tea saying that they're doing blockchain to a company that's actually I can't believe why would they I mean I mean what people mean, wouldn't they know they would run a foul for doing that? I don't know, probably. I mean I have no idea what happened at their managerial level there or like who's in charge of their Twitter feed. Like I don't know. Um but the, the problem comes not from like enterprises exploring some technology that may or may not be useful for enterprises doing B2B stuff. The problem comes when you start talking about saying something like, we're going to implement quote unquote decentralized identity, but now we are the arbiters of that identity and our customer base is going to need to ask, ask us for access to that, um, as opposed to say, letting humans maintain their attestations or their pieces of their identity themselves. Um, and it's it's a bleed of power away from even government sources of identity. Um, but from this, we do, for better or worse, or however you want to think about it right now, your identity and reputation is kind of decentralized, mostly because it's just not connected. It's just all over the place. And you, we see that as this kind of problem, because you can't use your reputation in one place to solve a problem in another place. But when you, once you connect those things together, you lose um, your ability to probably be anonymous. Um, we lose our ability to circumvent different types of censorship. Um, and you see a lot of these identity projects now focusing on, say, refugee populations who are already vulnerable. And now they're being experimented on with this kind of identity stuff where, you know, a consultancy has a backup of the, their private keys, right? Uh, in case, you know, your phone goes missing at the, at the border. Uh, and so looking at, at those types of pilots and what they're trying to solve and the, the power um, systems that they're playing with, I think that's much more useful than just saying, oh, why didn't you just use a database for okay. your post-trade settlement? So, so these are so these all fall under the, the, the category of, let's just say, enterprise blockchain. So what you're trying to say is there are good uses. And I think I agree with you. Um, there are good uses of what these, you know, enterprise blockchains and and the analogy or some someone once explained to me that, you know, for example, you take supply chain management, um, dull bananas, you have a banana in the supermarket, you don't know where that banana came from. And essentially, if we had the way to track the, you know, the chain of from when the banana was grown to where how it ended up in the supermarket, then uh, something like a blockchain would would enable us to have that ability to track that. And having a record of a chain of provenance sounds very benign, but it's not about the record. It's about who has access to different points in that record. Uh, That's my point. Yeah. And I really don't want um, 
I don't know how many hops away it is before I'm comfortable with someone knowing how many bananas I have in my fridge, but I'd prefer my health insurer not to know whether or not I'm buying five servings of fruits and vegetables. I, I think it's more of like when I buy a banana at the supermarket, I don't know where that banana has been. I want to know where that banana has well, been. These two I want things to know... are cross purposes, right? So are you going to surrender exactly. letting your health insurer know if you're eating vegetables to find out if your banana came from unsustainable Arms? Why is it a tip for a tat? Why, do, why does my health insurance have to get involved? Why can't I just walk in and scan a barcode on the, the what do you call a bunch of bananas together? I believe There's it's like called a, a bunch of it. bananas. No, it's not really. <laughs> so it's just a bunch, yeah. No, there's got to be a term for it, like a like, like a murder like a of bananas, or like a yeah, like a murder of bananas. Well, murder is for something, Gross. like a like a pot. I was in Africa at my friend's game reserve, and we literally sat, and he told me like, like the, this is like multiple of zebras. Is this? It's, I it's forgot called a zeal. I know that because that is the mascot of the Sea Cash Foundation. Is now a what? It's a zeal, zeal a zebras? collection of zebras. <laughs> I'm gonna Google multiple bananas. We just completely went off on a tangent here, but I now I really want to know. And my editors can completely like... Oh, no, you have um, to leave this part in. It's very important. No, it is. It's a, it's a bunch of bananas. You're right. <laughs> yes, I'm, I know it's I'm right. It's technically called a... <laughs> okay, so that... So a bunch of bananas are all exist on this enterprise blo blockchain thing. And so I, I agree with you. I think... <clears throat> it's not that the, the, the viewing keys could not be made to make this stuff segmented. There is no reason that you need to have third party data resale. It is not like mandated from some machine learning God on high. It's simply how the systems are are being built. And the idea that corporations are uh, altruistically going to create some sort of take back your data kind of system because people have mentioned it in a number of blog posts is misguided. It's simply not what's being built. Censorship resistance, Bitcoin, right? Those two, those two go together. How do you feel about that? Um, I think that a great measure of how any of these variety of networks that you have right now uh, achieve that goal is um, what the applicability to uh, consensual sex work trade is. But you, so you believe in that in that goal? Yeah. In censorship, okay. Um, I'll tell you why I'm asking. So, so I believe, and tell me if you agree with me, and, and feel free if I ever say anything stupid, just just call me out on it. I already mentioned um, the bananas thing. I think we're good. Okay, good, they, good. Thank you. So, I feel like all blockchains, not including enterprise blockchains, because those are like private; they're their own thing. We discussed that already. I'm moving on from that. Um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, Litecoin, Ripple. I don't even consider Ripple a, a blockchain, but that's I'm going to get the Ripple army against me right now. But they all exist on a spectrum. And you have a spectrum where on one end you have complete decentralization and you have on one end of the spectrum um, complete centralization. And they're, it's, they're constantly moving targets. And so I feel like... So even Bitcoin is not fully decentralized. But I don't think Bitcoin decentralization is, the, like, is really that kind of binary spectrum kind of a thing no, it's, it's at not. least an xyz axis well don't 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 forget y equals mx plus b <laughs> i understand we're doing basic algebra no i mean like um we when you this is why there's the table are we decentralized yet right i actually gave a talk at devcon um with my co-founder uh patrick nielsen last year about what the heck does should we be thinking about of as it's like the path to decentralization yeah. right well, throughout the entire software development life cycle um there are these points of soft again it's about soft power aggregation and these bottlenecks and it's not just about network topology although that's probably most measurable and visible but you know as we all say do privacy research and then you get a single company that makes a single hardware chip that says it will deliver privacy easily and gives a bunch of grants for that and a bunch of systems implement it, um, does that undermine, quote unquote, decentralization holistically? And there's a lot of different pieces to think about up and down the stack, um, technically, but also in your community. Who's involved in your BIP or EIP or ZIP process? Uh, do you only use GitHub, which has now been acquired by Microsoft? You know, who has maintainer access? Um, do you only publish documentation in a, a small number of languages? So it, 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 we could think a lot more holistically about these things. So you have the, you have, so what's a better way to describe it than a spectrum? I'm looking at like a no, rainbow I, spectrum. Well, <laughs> it is Pride Month. Um, well, I, I do say spectrum, but when I'm talking about the, the kind of um, linear spectrum between a 
distributed system with a central point of coordination and a decentralized kind of peer-to-peer network with certain types of properties. And there's trade-offs between kind of liveness and privacy sure. and all these different things that gets that gets a little technical but most you have trade-offs between between user experience and privacy it's like a lever system going back to the nuclear reactor one lever goes up the other lever goes yeah, down. yeah well that's kind of an emergent thing of what the system ends up looking like but um yeah a, there's decentralization is complicated i believe that's probably the easiest way to say it but uh even even when we're like we were talking about identity earlier it, you get a similar trade-off it is you cannot have um, a, a system. This is why we should not be doing voting, certainly not national voting systems on blockchain networks, because it is incredibly difficult to have a, a single individual retain a single vote and prevent all kind of sock puppetry uh, unless you everyone has a single kind of one off identity and you really cannot control these things. It's it's literally it's like an unsolved computer science problem. Anything that starts with so, any no, you're right. Anything that starts with, with centralized distribution is already doomed to fail. Yeah. So we deal with um, you know, we're preventing civil attacks in these types of decentralized networks because you do not have known entities transacting. Um and you don't know who owns them. It's very different when you talk about enterprise networks where you say, oh, this IP range is coming from the specific corporation and you can manage these things differently. It's a different type of trust environment. So how do how how would we say that, um, you know, like in Buddhism, you have uh, enlightenment, but you never actually reach enlightenment. It's always like, are you on the path to enlightenment? And um, your whole life, as long as you're on the path to enlightenment, it's like, Gan- you know, what Gandhi says, it's... Um, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. So that's why I say that, you know, these blockchains, as long as they're on the path to decentralization, then that's that's good enough or that's that's good for me. You have to get you have to try to get there. But there are some of them that, that have no intention of of ever fixing or ever wanting to to be there or have started off with such centralized mechanisms that they can never actually be decentralized no matter what they do. And therefore, they failed as these experiments and don't and let's not forget like this whole industry is just one big socioeconomic experiment we're not even in version 1 yet yeah well there'll probably be securities and then there'll be parts of securities products and they'll have achieved something else it's just you know there are a lot of different problems in the world to solve and a lot of different people that need to do different things so you know bitcoin will continue doing what bitcoin does it, it other things are not going to be able to necessarily emulate that, but it doesn't mean that some other projects won't have value in other ways. Why did you leave JP Morgan to start Clover and what is Clover? Um, well, I, at the time I had just achieved a lot more than I was really expecting to be able to. Um, That's a good thing, right? Yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, I really, I, who knew we'd be able to kind of publish the very first open source uh, code on GitHub for JP Morgan ever. That was really exciting. Um, but a lot of the work uh, I was kind of uncovering at the time that a lot of the work that needs to be done to make these systems really usable um, at production scale, uh, you can't really do that from inside a financial institution because they're, I mean, they're a publicly traded company. Their mandate is to increase value for shareholders, right? And the, you know, being able to assure people of a return on investment from an extremely R and D type technical project is uh, low. So, um, so I wanted to go work on some technical, more technical stuff. And uh, so at Clover, we're working on. Um, creating a infrastructure and uh, coordination kind of tooling, developer tooling, um, the really ways not just for, it's not just about enterprise, it's kind of a single solution, a single thing you can use, whether you want to run a node that connects to a public network or a hundred nodes that connect to a public network, or whether you're creating an enterprise consortium of a hundred nodes that only ever connect to each other. Um, tooling wise, you should really be using kind of the same thing. And it is a little weird that a lot of the people in this blockchain space, they're either newer to uh, development or we've done like a really bad job of being interesting to and recruiting like That's really an good engineers from other fields. Really? Right? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, because they're like, these I'm blockchain people are crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, you know, every time blockchain is mentioned on Hacker News, it's just a string of comments of people being like, these people are 
bananas. Um, so building tools that like draw from that experience and don't throw away what we know about software engineering um, and that use commonly known paradigms and that can integrate to your CI CD pipeline and all this other stuff. So uh, it doesn't sound very sexy, uh, but it's, gonna, it's really critical to solve some of the lower level usability challenges. When I say lower level usability, I mean like developers, like people that know what they're doing. It's not solving the, this interface for this wallet is not clear. Is it um, low level uh, just helping people buy Bitcoin? <laughs> Maybe. I meant, I meant like, you know. So you're like low level, but metal. like enterprise <laughs> low level. Um, we're, well, we're just, right now it is more about putting tools in developers' hands. But, you know, personally, I care a lot about making things more accessible that are considered too technical for non-developers. And so we can do a lot to make things that right now you you need to have some familiarity with a, a command line usually or know how to spin up your own instance or you know, know something about a cloud or whatever to uh, participate in a lot of these networks. Um, I think we could do a lot better job of making it accessible to everybody. And that, that would help adoption. I, I miss the days when the best way and the most stable way to work with Bitcoin is through the command line wallet and through Bitcoin D. Well, that uh, sounds super cypherpunk, but it really is like at odds with getting regular people to participate. Right? You're, right. You're right. And so I think the, the idea was back then, if you can't, if you don't have time to take the time, if you can't take the time to learn how to use this, then you shouldn't be like an early adopter. And I mean, even there's that funny Satoshi quote to, to Dan Larimer. Most people don't know that it was Satoshi talking to Dan Larimer. This quote, this is what he said. He said, I don't have time to explain it to you. If you don't understand it, like I'm busy or whatever. I, it's not verbatim, but he basically said, I'm not, if, if you don't understand it, I don't have time to explain it to you. Have a nice day. Yep. And that's the failing of the cypherpunk movement from the beginning, right? Like saying that everyone should use PGP. Like nobody does that. Everybody I talk to, you know, journalists or, or whomever, like people just use Signal now because it's or usable. Yeah. Like you publish your PGP key, but then you I contact like somebody on Signal. Sure. Um, but you're right. But as you, the, 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 it goes back to what I said earlier, the user experience, as it goes up, as it goes down, the security goes up. But if you want better security and privacy, the user experience has gone, goes down. Yeah, I do not think it's fair to tax people on their time who have three jobs and are struggling to make ends meet to sit down and read white papers or understand these sorts of things. It's it's not fair to them any more than, you know, we wire our own houses with copper wiring. We don't like ourselves, you know, like now it's considered cool to like go into a makerspace and figure out how to solder stuff. Like not only is that a vocation that millions of people do as their job and they know more about electric wiring than you do, but you know, when you need to fix something, they don't call you up and say, well, if you really cared about your lights, you'd figure it out. My electrician tells me that actually. <laughs> he does. Well, no, he go. doesn't. Do it yourself. But, um, speaking of which, I got an email from my college economics professor the other day and the email went like this. He said, Hey Charlie, I hope you're doing well. I've seen in the news, um, I want to work in the blockchain space. What can I do? And I responded back, and I don't know why I said this, but I was like, w write something that can read white papers for me. <laughs> well, we already have like the natural language processing thing that will spit them out, right? Like that just garbles together all of the papers and creates new ones as a farce. Yeah. So this can't be far behind. So he, he, invented, um, he invented the technology that he ended up selling to like – Duolingo and these translation companies where he invented this, he wrote this software and patented it many years ago, like in the, in the late nineties and early two thousands that basically, um, this is from what he told me that, that can, can take, um, a foreign language document and translate it in context based on like how many times different words were used or words that were used together and things like that. Mm -hmm. better than like a Google Translate. But Google Translate didn't exist at the time. So that's why I said that. I said you should have what, you know, write something that can read white papers for me. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, otherwise we just employ an army of interns that do that. And they don't even end up reading them. They just skim them for word proximity for sure. True. So um, Zcash. Yeah. Do you think Zcash is on the, the spectrum towards decentralization? 
Um, I mean, the network wise, uh, it's certainly decentralized and then a number of different actors run nodes. I think they also are subject to having an, a small number of mining pools that are uh, overweight contributors. I think what people talk about when they talk about decentralization of Zcash is the overweight contribution of the electric coin company. Is that what you're getting at? No, I, I, I want to start picking your brain, throwing out like random coins and tokens and see what you think about them. Oh, I have no opinions on like pretty much any of that. I really what about try Ripple? Not. <laughs> you don't want the Ripple army going after you. I, I, I do not. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I am on the board of the Zcash Foundation. I'm happy to kind of talk about their principles and what it looks like and all of that. Uh, we just got back from Zcon 1, where there were a lot of proposals about changes to governance and, um, you know, contribution. There's This year, they proposed an official uh, Zcash improvement process, which is somewhat similar to the BIP process, but a little different um, to make sure that the company is not the kind of sole maintainer of the network upgrade process. Um, the Zcash Foundation actually released the first uh, implementation of uh, Zcash that is not the one maintained by ECC. Congratulations. So, yeah, yeah. So they, so the electric coin company, which used to be called Zcash Co. until recently, um, they have Zcash D, similar to Bitcoin D. Um, so the foundation has uh, created, in conjunction with Parity, um, what's now called Zebra D, and it's a Rust implementation of the Zcash protocol. So there are two now, and that's part of the uh, attempt to decentralize. I realize it's just two, but to um, you know, split the governance and create some checks and balances and create a kind of more robust process and community. But can a can a project that started more centralized eventually seek centralization or seek enlightenment? Yeah, sure. I mean, e even Bitcoin was, you know, amongst a small number of participants early on. It's, it's just a, a process. And when these things started, Be careful, the Bitcoin maximalists listen to this show. I understand that, no, but I'm I mean, it, at some point it was <laughs> yeah. a mailing, a very small mailing it was. list. Right? It was dozens of people and you can mine on your MacBook. Yeah. I miss those days. Yeah, my co-founder received that initial um, mail and uh, promptly deleted it as being like, what's this guy talking about? <laughs> oh, with the, the Satoshi mailing list email? Yeah, yeah. Good times. It was good times. And so... Um, what brought you to New York? You're from Florida. I am. Um, well, I always kind of wanted to go. Well, I always wanted to get out of Florida first and foremost. Why? But, uh, <laughs> How dare you? Um, I, I mean, New York is a like, you know, it's almost like its own country. It's like this cultural bastion, financial bastion. You know, you can really do anything and um, find anybody who's interested in anything up here. Uh, Florida is certainly not like that. It's a much... I don't know, smaller kind of mindset there. I love it here. It, yeah. You can do the whole decentralization world, but um, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic place to live. But I do, I do kind of miss, miss New York sometimes. And, but the talent pool is really hard here to get. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was in on the East coast I think you're on the West coast and it was, um, between Palm Beach and Miami, there is a lot going on. And now that I am further on in my career, I probably, I do know a number of companies that are kind of doing some cool things down there. Uh, but co just coming kind of fresh out of college, as far as what the opportunity set was then, which was, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever. Um, Cause I worked a couple years down there before I moved up. It was just, there was just very few opportunities in what I wanted to do. And New York was full of them. So. Yeah, there are there are not the most opportunities in your in Clover. Do you work with larger institutions who are building out these enterprise chains? Yeah, we work with. Uh, yeah, we people all over the place because uh, we're really working on getting all these different kind of components together. So, yeah, from a, a user standpoint, the corporate um, early access program has very large kind of Fortune 100 types in it. Yeah. The question I wanted to ask you was, you had a quote here um, when I was doing I was doing some research earlier. You said, I'm going to read you the quote. We said, we tell women, don't talk about money. Don't talk about your promotions. When you're good enough, someone will tap on the shoulder, tap on your shoulder and escort you to the next level. But that's not how it's going to happen. Um, what do you think of that in the in the what? crypto space? In the 
Well, the um, crypto space is diff- a little interesting since there's very flat authority models here. There's, um, I was speaking a little bit more about these kind of bureaucracies um, where there's more of a rigid. I've always felt process. that the crypto space is a lot more uh, inclusive. Um, I mean, inclusive is a super loaded word. I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, and a lot of great. Um, people are doing a lot of great things that said, you know, it is kind of at the nexus of a number of other subcultures that previously existed who have historically been not super inclusive. And so the first movers into the area um, were representative of those initial subcultures. Um, So we started with that kind of problem. I think that that there's been a lot of work to undo that early. Um, But yeah, I mean, I don't think that uh, the quote unquote crypto slash blockchain space has uh, very much of a different problem than the rest of tech in general. It's it's like just a 20 percent, 80 percent issue. Well, you you said something interesting that um, all of us who got involved in crypto early were people who really didn't fit in um, in other industries or in other social norms really well. And I feel like that's true. We didn't exist. And we all kind of like um, a joke that the the social score of all crypto people is extremely low. And we didn't really focus on like social norms and, and communication and things like that. And so that's kind of the way it was it, it was started off. We're very abrasive and um, assertive and spoke our mind, didn't really beat around the bush. And some people just didn't like that. I don't think that that's dissuasive to having, if you're specifically speaking about women, I don't think that that's necessarily dissuasive. I think I'm pretty assertive. I've been on Usenet forums back in the 90s. I'm plenty familiar with the communication standards. Um, I think when we were just talking about how you move forward, it's simply there's there's a feeling that um, that your work should be recognized that I guess we're kind of enculturated into um, that many underrepresented minorities kind of feel that if they do good enough job, if their star shines bright enough, people will just recognize that. Whereas um, other folks tend to just say, hey, did you notice how great I am? And I'm going to go get this or I'm going to ask about this thing. It's a little more proactive. And I don't know why necessarily it is that way, but in practice, it certainly has been. And so just simply telling people, you need, don't be so afraid to be a little more self-promotive than you are comfortable with, because if you're not speaking up in your voice, that silence is going to be filled with somebody else who's more mediocre than you, like taking that spot. So sure. like, just crush it, go for it. And that's why, and I feel like in the crypto space, the ability to do that and to speak up for yourself and to uh, be assertive. Um, it's a lot better and it's a lot easier to do that in this space versus in, in, in other older, uh, in other industries or in tech industries or whatever, because the people that got involved really early and, and uh, shaped our space didn't care for these like social norms. Uh, I mean, it's a little tricky to, to say that one is better than the other. I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to say that just being able to be abrasive all the time because that's one the way one subset feels comfortable means that that should be like the default and it's better like we hopefully there's some kind of coming together towards the middle (laughs) where you know there are certainly people who could learn to listen a little more or could learn to present nuance a little better um, and that would probably serve them well in their daily life as well as on the internet not crypto Uh, twitter uh, no, crypto Twitter is perfect as it is. Of Do course, you, are you being broke. sarcastic? I, I, I've been out <laughs> of New York for a while. No, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to tell people. Um, and this is the the counterpoint. I'm going to argue against myself, but the counterpoint is telling people you need to stand up and go get, go get it for yourself. It's it's that's unfortunately what you have to do right now. But I don't think it's fair to say that that kind of default, if you don't grab it, you don't deserve it, is the way that society should be. And so maybe we could be working to be um, to uh, make thing make it available for people to not have to act that way and still succeed. I, as they say, from from your mouth to God's ears, and I really hope that happens, and and we we become more inclusive of that and and allow people to to say whatever they want but at the same time um do it in in i don't know polite ways or whatever i, I don't really know well, it's 
not necessarily being polite, but I mean, I, I know some of the, <laughs> the best cryptographers and hackers and stuff in the world. And um, some of the almost, almost uniformly across the board, the people that are the most talented, the most skilled, the most um, intelligent. Have no communication skills. No, not that. They, are, they do tend to be quieter. The people that uh, are at the top of their field in many situations are some of the most gentle communicators, the, most, uh, the people who will listen to you the most, and the people who um, do not discount new entrants or force them to prove themselves, and the quickest to say when something is not their area of domain expertise. So being loud does not always equate with being the most talented. And... No, I, I agree with you. And I feel like on crypto Twitter, especially in other places, you have like this super minority that basically comes and um, is so loud and vocal. We assume that that's representing of Bitcoin or of crypto where we had I had a guest yesterday who literally has he was the director of customer support. And have, and he personally has answered over 100,000 tickets for one of the largest companies in the crypto space. He said that 99% of people that that use crypto, that love crypto, aren't even on Twitter. Oh, true. Yeah, sure. So where do you see where do you see the future of of the cooperation between lar- and because this is like a big, you know, when are the institution coming? When are the institutions coming? And you're so you're on the front lines of that. You're talking to them. What do you see the cooperation of the crypto space? versus and not versus the crypto space and the big tech are are we going to see like more facebook libra types are we going to see more cooperation between bitcoin and and the 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 libertarian-esque types i think that um a lot of that is just dependent i mean you're speaking i assume in a a bit of a u.s centric way so we're talking uh, about In in the U.S., it's really dependent on where this kind of regulation is going. And if um, it becomes if it stays incredibly unclear here um, and larger institutions are not able to do anything um, for fear of business and legal risk, then other countries uh, with different regulatory climates will probably step up and provide those services. Um, The question then will be whether or not people in the U.S. will be able to participate and access those services because it's really the on and off ramps, those kind of gateways back out to fiat cash where um, there's the largest risk um, to people that still want to do that. I'm sure you have plenty of listeners who feel like you should just transact entirely in crypto your whole life. Um, but for for many people, that's their risk, is they're concerned sure. that if they put something in, they won't ever be able to get it out. Um, and that really is dependent on these very um, isolated kind of uh, gateways that we have and how they are regulated and what uh, compliance requirements are put on them. Amber, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. How can people... How can people follow you? Oh, I'm on Twitter at Amber Balday, which is B-A-L-D-E-T. That's probably easiest. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, and have a good weekend. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Scott Offord, the creator of Crypto Mining. Scott's a broker of ASIC mining gear and helps people buy and sell their miners. He created a Bitcoin mining profitability calculator and an interactive ASIC hardware comparison chart that you can find at CryptoMining.Tools. It's the only free online tool for calculating profitability and days to ROI. That includes the impact of the Bitcoin block reward having. The calculator lets you put in your estimated uptime to give you a more realistic profit projections. So check it out and find Scott on Telegram and Twitter at O-F-F-O-R-D-S-C-O-T-T. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.